Good morning. I really want to thank you all for joining us today on a, what looks like a lovely Friday. Um, I'm Marion Mulkey. I'm the director of the Health Reform and Public Programs Initiative at the California Healthcare Foundation. It really is a pleasure to be here today uh, with a terrific panel and this broad audience to discuss the basic health program option and what it might mean for California. Our work in the uh, California Healthcare Foundation Health Reform and Public Programs Initiative works in two areas, really. We aim to advance California's effective implementation of opportunities available under the Affordable Care Act, and we work to support the evolution of California's public programs, predominantly Medi-Cal, but, but all of the coverage options available to Californians um, now and under the Affordable Care Act, um, while promoting, of course, the effective stewardship of state resources to that end. Um, the BHP, the Basic Health Program option, is certainly a substantial topic within that portfolio of work. When you think about the connection to the Affordable Care Act, it's an option made possible by the federal health reform law. Um, it's uh, proximity, its presence between existing public program options and the Medi-Cal expansion that will come into play in 2014 and the private options that will be available under the Affordable Care Act in 2014. And of course, its basic aim of expanding coverage and affordability, which are policy goals that are of course uh, central to CHCF's portfolio of work more broadly. Um, for that reason, the California Healthcare Foundation has, uh, for a while now, been supporting work looking at what that optional program, the basic health program, might mean for California. About a year ago, uh, here in the Capitol, we presented some work um, provided by Branch McNeil and colleagues at Mercer, looking uh, fairly narrowly at the question of the financial impact of the basic health program option um, on the state budget. Um, the Mercer team concluded that there did appear to be room um, within that option to in, put in place a basic health program option without putting at risk the state general fund. Uh, although they also acknowledge that there are substantial areas of uncertainty that remain in terms of federal guidance and that there are many other policy considerations that might and should inform one's thinking about whether the basic health program uh, makes sense for California. Another body of work that we supported came from the Institute of Health Policy Solutions, working with researchers John Graves and John Gruber, um, who looked at the volatility of income based on national data uh, inside and out of that band of income of people that would be eligible for the basic health program. Um, they looked at how volatile people's income is and concluded that there would be a lot of movement in all directions in and out of that income band. Both of these analyses, we thought, uh, offered important perspectives on the BHP, but by design, they each delved into a subset of all the issues that might be worth considering when you think about what that option would mean for the state of California. So over the course of last summer and fall, um, CHCF continued to be approached by a number of individuals and policy staff um, seeking, to, seeking our assistance in understanding the BHP option. Um, the request really reminded us, uh, as if we needed reminding in the context of the Affordable Care Act, that this is big, complex, nuanced, and worth perhaps a broader sort of landscape perspective of all the considerations that might inform our thinking about the basic health program. So today's presentation is really going to take that broad perspective. Now I want to acknowledge that there are people in this room who have thought long and deep and hard about this issue and uh, there may not be a lot that's brand new in our presentation today. But I also want to suggest that um, if you've come into this room thinking, there, if there's one thing I know about the BHP, it's X, um, we may be here to ask you to think about it in a little bit more nuanced way, to think about, well, wait, maybe there is a diversity of uh, effects of the BHP that I haven't quite uh, contemplated yet. So that's really what our goal is, and I think what this terrific panel is going to do for us today, um, bring, uh, bring a little more insight, cause us maybe uh, not to see it as such a cut and dried issue, even by a policy goal or constituency. Um, so it's going to be a great, thought-provoking panel. Let me introduce our um, speakers and panelists. Um, we have with us today, and I'm not going to do the bio thing because you have the long bio in your material, um, but we have with us today uh, 
Nancy Wise, who is the Vice President of Planning and Strategy uh, for HTMS, a consulting firm. We have Jerry Kaminsky, who directs the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, well known to all of us with his colleague Ken Jacobs and many other colleagues uh, for producing high quality uh, data, uh, which has contributed to our thinking today. And Lucian Wilson, the Executive Director of the Insure the Uninsured Project, who is again uh, well known to almost any of us who is working in this area of expanding coverage in California. Um, special thanks to Jerry and Lucian, who both got up uh, in the dark wee hours to get up here today with us. So very much appreciate their joining us. Couple of housekeeping notes before we get um, started. There is this bright yellow evaluation form. We really appreciate people taking a moment to um, provide us feedback. We do look at it and think, at it, think about it and try to continuously improve um, on our briefings. Um, we have, uh, the session is being videotaped. The video and slides will be up on the CHCF website, um, we think by next Tuesday. And our next briefing is going to be May 31st, um, highlighting findings from a brand new CHCF survey of Medi-Cal beneficiaries, which we're uh, excited to be releasing around that time. Uh, I think that's my list of things to say. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce Nancy Wise and Jerry Kaminsky who are gonna tag team on some of the observations and findings of this recent analysis. Thanks, Marion. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to present to you all um, some of the findings from our research on the basic health program and um, which was only possible through Marion's brilliant and creative leadership on the project. And I should also acknowledge that it worked on this project with two colleagues, Jonathan Leonard and Katie Harrigan, who were often behind the scenes, um, but really critical to the, to the quality of the work we did. So what we're gonna do today is um, provide a little bit of context and overview for uh, about the basic health program. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry, who will give a description of a profile of the uh, BHP eligible population. And then we'll spend some time reviewing how a BHP um, could impact policy goals in California, and then we'll have a few concluding thoughts. So many of you are likely familiar with the concept of a basic health program. And those who are new to this conversation, um, the Affordable Care Act includes a provision that allows states to create a basic health program to provide coverage for some of its residents who would otherwise be eligible to obtain coverage through the health benefit exchange. So to be eligible for a BHP, you need to have income between 138 and 200% of federal poverty level, be a US citizen or lawfully pre present immigrant, be under the age of 65, and uh, not be eligible for other coverage, such as Medicaid, Medicare, CHIP, military coverage, or employer-sponsored coverage uh, that meets standards of being comprehensive and affordable. In addition, the program has some requirements outlined in the ACA, and those include that the benefit design is benchmarked by the essential health benefit package, as defined by California, or by the state, and that cost sharing is benchmarked to plans um, on the HBE, or on the exchange by income level. So while the description of the BHP outlined, is outlined in the ACA, there are still some unknowns um, that require further guidance at the federal level. And also, within federal boundaries, the state has a great deal of discretion on how to define the benefit design, uh, network payment rates, uh, location of the BHP, um, and other components. So those decisions would significantly affect how a BHP would impact California. The financing of a BHP, um, uh, the BHP would be paid for by the federal government in the form of a premium subsidy that's equal to 95% of what the federal government would have paid for these same individuals had they obtained coverage through the exchange, and plus the amount of the cost-sharing subsidy that would have been available under the, the exchange, um, either at 95 or 100%, um, and there the ACA is a little unclear on the cost-sharing subsidy uh, uh, definition. There, and there could be gaps between the federal payment and state expenditures, and we'll discuss this a little bit more in the presentation. So the concept of the, the BHP was authorized through the Affordable Care Act, but we're still awaiting guidance from the feds on a few issues, such as mechanisms for reconciliation of payments to the state, reimbursement level for cost sharing, as I just indicated, and then the availability of federal support for BHP administrative costs. And at the state level, there's pending legislation in the form of uh, 
um, SB 703, uh, Hernandez bill that establishes the basic health program for California to be administered by the Managed Risk Medical Board or Mr. Meb. The BHP is um, being considered by other states as well, and we've got a colorful map here to demonstrate that. Um, there are several states considering legislation, including California, Washington, Michigan, New York, Connecticut, and Hawaii. And seven more states have legislation in place requiring a BHP analysis, including Utah, New Mexico, Indiana, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And then independent analyses have been performed in several other states as well. But no state has yet committed to a post-ACA uh, basic health program. Marion mentioned uh, uh, briefly some recent research that is focused on the basic health program in California. And those uh, initial analyses um, by Mercer and another one by the Urban Institute uh, both found that a BHP could be implemented with enough funding in the budget to consider reduced cost sharing for consumers, increased provider payments, or even some creative reimbursement strategies. Both of those studies use the definition of uh, annual income, um, determined eligibility for the BHP using a figure that represented uh, actual annual income at the end of the year. And they, both studies also further explored and commented upon how BHP could impact other areas of the state, such as the exchange. And then, as Marion also remembered, there, uh, mentioned, there was um, further research by um, the Institute for Health Policy Solutions. And um, they, they were looking at the difference, um, uh, rather, uh, sorry, because when people enroll in a BHP, their eligibility is determined by the projected annual income based on what's known as a single point in time. That could vary a great bit from um, the actual annual income at the end of the year. And to model that difference, they used data from the Survey of Income and Program Participation, or SIP, which is a longitudinal study that interviews families multiple times over at least three years. And it shows how research, uh, how family size and income change over time. And that definitely complicates the analysis of the BHP. So then um, uh, a final note here on our, uh, our precursor is in the context of this background, we ventured to, to build upon this previous research to get some of the perspectives and include um, uh, thoughts from constituents in California. At the same time, there were some alternative uh, perspectives that came up. Um, we had, uh, for instance, there's a couple quotes here. If there's a problem with subsidies, then let's fix that problem rather than creating a whole new government program. Or another quote, we could be comparing whether to do a BHP not to the scenario with no intervention, but rather to the next best alternative. And these perspectives are important to keep in mind before we get started, but they also uh, could run the risk of straying too far down from a, a boundaried path. So we chose to focus the findings presented here within the, the op pol policy options that are available to us here um, and looking um, largely at a future with or without a basic health program in California. And you can see these purple call-out boxes here throughout the presentation, and those indicate quotes from our interviews. So to get the conversation started today, um, first we'll hear the profile of the BHP um, from Jerry. And this is an important piece of context because who this population is provides important insight into how BHP could impact the policy goals. And after that, we'll spend a few minutes walking through um, some of the policy goals and discussing how the BHP could impact those. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to be presenting data that we've um, data analysis that we've recently conducted using um, uh, both our uh, CalSim microsimulation model developed jointly by UCLA and uh, Berkeley um, Labor Center, as well as the sorry, let me um, as well as uh, data from the 2009 California Health Interview Survey or CHIS data. Uh, our CalSim model uses the national MEPS data as its core database, then reweights the results to match California's population using CHIS. CalSim, therefore, is useful in answering questions regarding healthcare expenditures, utilization, and health status. But CHIS is also useful in describing the BHP eligible population because it contains some measures of health status and utilization that are not available in MEPS. Uh, the first slide shows that in uh, 2014, we estimate that uh, 948,000 Californians will be eligible for BHP. And when I say I'm going to distinguish in a few slides, um, this definition of eligibility uh, includes all the criteria that Nancy explained a few slides ago. So this is the actual eligibility requirements under ACA. Um, 
The BHP eligible population represents about 36 percent of the population that's eligible for exchange subsidies, according to estimates that we've recently produced for the Health Benefit Exchange Board. So this 948,000 represents about 36 percent of that total eligible population. Almost all of these eligibles, BHP eligibles, are adults, although the distribution of eligible adults skews younger on average relative to California's overall population. Uh, the BHP eligible population is also, as you can see here, more likely to be female. It's, uh, the state's population is 50-50. Here it's 55-45. Regarding income distribution, BHP eligibility by definition is based in part on income, and 85% of the el eligibles have income between 139 and 200% of the FPL. The 810,000 eligibles between 139 and 200% FPL represent about one quarter of the state's entire population that falls within this income band. Uh, the remaining eligibles below 139% of FPL I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, one concern about the uh, BHP eligible population is whether they represent a higher or lower average risk relative to other exchange eligibles. Now, based on separate analyses that I haven't fully presented here, BHP eligibles are more likely to report good, fair, or poor health status compared to California's entire non-elderly adult population. And that percentage is 54% uh, among BHPs and 46%. So if we use self-reported health status, we see that the BHP eligible population relative to California's population as a whole skews somewhat uh, more likely to report poorer health status in general. In further analysis not presented here, we found that BHP eligibles have essentially the same distribution of health status as the remaining exchange eligible population between uh, 201 and 400 percent of FPL. So when we compare the BHP eligibles to the rest of the exchange eligible population, we find actually very little difference in self-reported health status. Regarding current health insurance status, slightly more than half of BHP eligibles live in families without any health insurance coverage. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, this shows the proportion of BHP eligibles who are legal permanent residents, or LPRs, for less than five years by income category. So LPRs with less than five years of residency in the U.S. are important category because these individuals are excluded from federal Medicaid matching funds. So their Medi-Cal coverage is fully funded by the state. Currently, the state provides coverage for about 80,000 LPRs through Medi-Cal, and this expense is fully funded by the state without federal matching funds. As this slide also shows, LPRs represent about 20% of the BHP eligible population, and 72%, or about three quarters of the LPRs, are below 139% of the federal poverty level. This next slide uh, shows the population of potentially that's potentially eligible for BHP if income was the only factor used in determining eligibility. And I really, I guess the slide doesn't have enough caveats on here, so let me just make sure that I uh, caveat this uh, appropriately. This population is not the population that's currently eligible for the basic health plan. This is a very broad definition based solely on income and doesn't exclude the other, I'm sorry, does not include the other criteria which narrow the, the eligible population considerably. As a result, you'll see that in this slide about 3.1 million are potentially eligible versus the 948,000 uh, shown in the previous slide. About half of the potentially eligible population uh, we estimate in 2014 would have employer-sponsored insurance, and about 9% would have insurance in the individual market. Uh, in addition, about 36% of the potentially eligible BHP uh, population would be uninsured. Uh, 
So continuing with this definition of potentially eligible um, uh, BHP population, uh, one concern regarding both the exchange and the BHP eligible populations is whether there's an adequate supply of providers to handle the large expansion of newly insured Californians in 2014. This slide provides one way of looking at the issue. Uh, based on 2009 CHIS data, um, and that's why the, the total number in this slide is slightly different from the previous slide, which is based on our CalSIM model. But based on 2009 CHIS data, about 31% of the population potentially eligible for BHP reports using the safety net as their usual source of care while 37% report using private or commercial insurers as, as their usual source of care. Therefore, almost one-third report no usual source of care at all. Furthermore, more than half of those with no usual source of care did not have any doctor's visits during the past year, suggesting potential underutilization of primary care among this population. Finally, uh, we examine the data shown on the previous slide separately for the uninsured and for those in the individual market. Both the uninsured and those with insurance in the individual market seek care from a diverse set of providers. Consistent with the findings from many other studies, those with insurance in the individual market are much more likely to report doctor's visits during the past year compared to the uninsured, and that rate is 74% versus 58%. The uninsured are substantially more likely to report no usual source of care, 54% versus 31%, relative to the entire potentially eligible BHP population shown on the previous slide. Among the uninsured with no usual source of care, more than 60% had no doctor's visits during the past year. This finding raises concerns about possible unmet need or pent-up demand for doctor's visits that is not reflected in measures of self-reported health status, which I discussed earlier as being relatively similar between BHP eligibles and the remaining exchange eligible population. Um, and now I'm even more excited to get to the part where we share the results. Um, but just before we get that, I'm uh, going to take a few minutes to describe what our process was. So uh, initially, we uh, convened a meeting of uh, leaders in California with uh, um, and experts on the basic health program in December of 2011 to gather input on key questions and an analytic approach for further research. We identified those areas uh, for research. Um, we reviewed the publicly available uh, state studies from other states. And then we conducted structured interviews with selected California leaders to explore um, how the BHP could impact different consumers and stakeholders. Then we filtered those findings by content area to artic articulate themes across the interviews. And then finally, we summarized key goals, controversies, unknowns, impacts, and issues. Um, and as I mentioned before, because there are a lot of unknowns still related to the BHP, um, these findings are intended to um, offer insight and raise questions. So um, the those that we interviewed, um, we interviewed health insurance carriers, those both, uh, those both with and without Medicaid business, providers including perspectives from hospitals, community clinics, clinics and medical groups, con consumer advocacy organizations, industry advoc advocacy groups representing different segments of the industry, uh, policy and California health industry experts and leaders in state agencies. Um, and these interviews were fantastic. Um, shows there how much deep thinking has gone into the BHP uh, in the state. So enough on the how, um, let's transition to the results. So first and most visibly, uh, how would a BHP impact the policy goal of maximizing health insurance coverage for low-income people? Well, it turns out that answering this question isn't as simple as we might have initially thought. Everyone that we interviewed agreed that the cost of coverage is very, very important. Uh, but there were differences um, in opinions on the ways that the cost of coverage is important. So we've broken this down into several categories or several drivers ar around this. First, those who believe that consumer contributions, so that includes premiums and coinsurance, are really the overwhelming factor for people who are purchasing insurance. The, the people that, with this perspective believe that the only way to expand coverage is to lower its cost, uh, the cost of uh, obtaining coverage, and to do it as significantly as possible. 
Um, so, and there's a perspective here on that. Uh, there's no way that their share of costs in the exchange will be low enough for people under 200% of poverty to afford them. The only way to cover everyone is if coverage costs consumers less. So the next perspective, looking at choice and access as complementary drivers. So others um, with this perspective suggest that while cost to the consumer is indeed important, there are other factors that also really influence uh, coverage purchasing decisions. Um, and this perspective suggests that consumers must perceive that their coverage is desirable before they're willing to spend money on it. So a quote that summarizes this perspective, there are many people in this income group who can and will pay something uh, they will, have a, they will have a greater willingness to pay based upon their perceived value of plan and provider choice. And then finally, the third perspective, that also agreeing that affordability is an issue, highlights that there are other significant barriers to enrollment, such as proof of income, in-person enrollment requirements, and so on. So that perspective is summarized in the third quote here. It's true that money is important, but the primary barriers to coverage are obstacles related to enrollment. Um, other provisions of the ACA, such as Medicaid standardization, um, income testing, uh, MAGI income testing, and so on, are intended to relieve some of these barriers. So with that activity taking place, we will not focus as much on that part of the conversation for BHP. But before we get to uh, walking through those in a little bit more detail, we thought, well, since cost is what's on the table here, let's look at a difference of what these costs would be for individuals to obtain coverage, either through a BHP or on the exchange. And as we said, you know, the estimates on, on here are still based on uh, speculative uh, research, but we've, we've come up with the best we can just to further our discussion. So, um, here you can see that for individuals, so this is a single adult with incomes at 150% of federal poverty level, the difference between purchasing insurance through the exchange versus the BHP amounts to the difference between $54 to $10 or about $44 per month. And for individuals at 200% of federal, federal poverty level, this amounts to the difference between $113 and $20 or about $93 per month. So. Um, and again, these are assumed uh, BHP premiums uh, based on the analysis that was done by Mercer earlier. So keep these numbers in mind as we walk through the perspectives that we articulated on the last slide. So we've got uh, this uh, spelled out a little bit more here in detail. For those people who believe that consumer cost sharing is a primary driver for purchasing insurance coverage, the cost to the member as the over is the overwhelming driver for consumer decision making. With this perspective, the only way to get more people to enroll is to lower costs to the consumer, which would lead to overall a broader pool of people in the risk pool and therefore a healthier risk pool overall. People who see purchasing dynamics in this manner are more likely to advocate for the BHP. And uh, we, I think we've all seen research that reflects that the dynamic that lowering costs entices people to buy more and that's well established in economic literature and also has been applied to the purchase of health insurance as well. Um, those who represent the next perspective highlight choice and access as the primary drivers. They still agree that cost is important, but uh, identify that choice and access are important as well. So for instance, some, consumer, some purchasers may value a product less if it limits their access to providers that they're used to seeing, a dynamic that may be especially important for those who are accustomed to private rather than safety net providers who may be in this income group. People who value the product less, whether due to network stigma or other factors, may be less likely to buy the product unless they need it, which could lead to less favorable risk. And although this perspective is less well explored, there is some data that supports it. According to a 2011 study funded by the Blue Shield of California Foundation that interviewed people at 200% of federal poverty level, about 40% of those interviewed indicated that they did not really feel that they had a choice for where they could receive care. But of those remaining 60% who did feel as though they had a choice, only 12% indicated for them that cost was the driving factor. What was more important to these individuals was convenience, referral by a, a trusted friend, relative or social services professional. So we see there is some evidence that supports that um, there could be additional factors besides costs that are influencing these purchasing decisions. So um, proponents of each of these perspectives highlight their own research and experience with those in this income bracket to support their perspective. <laughs> And which market factors, uh, behaviors they believe will dominate is largely based on their assumptions of who is in the BHP population. 
um, where this population currently seeks care and what this population's priorities are when making purchasing decisions. So, and as Jerry shared with us earlier, UCLA research suggests that the health status of the BHP eligible income bracket is comparable to that of the rest of the subsidy eligible population in the exchange. So that risk, that risk differential there shouldn't be the driving force. Um, but again, as Jerry shared with us, because the BHP population includes a blend of individuals with a range of circumstances, values, and needs, it's difficult to know which of these two dynamics we've addressed here will be the dominant one. So on to the next policy goal, the goal related to state financial risk. And uh, this is quite simple, right? The goal is to minimize financial risk to California. And accomplishing this involves identifying the potential costs and savings, um, as well as the level of uncertainty associated with those. And this slide is a little less simple. If we look at costs for the BHP program, the estimated budget for claims coverage is roughly $3 billion, which is shown here as 3,000 million to keep us all in the same unit, millions throughout the slide. Um, uh, and while there are potentially a number of direct or indirect factors that could cause program estimates to have some risk associated with them, we focused on several here that are most notable due to their size and level of uncertainty. So um, first we looked at the cost of administering the BHP. At the low end of the range of what that could cost is benchmarked to Medi-Cal. So Medi-Cal Medi -Cal is a fairly efficient program with administrative costs of about 4.5% of budget. If the BHP is as efficient as Medi-Cal, that would lead to an administrative budget around $137 million. At the higher end, uh, we looked at reference different state analyses uh, in other states related to the BHP, where we saw program costs estimated between 8 and 12%. So it's true that the program costs for BHP could be higher than Medi-Cal because there could be some additional administrative functions, such as premium billing and others. There, um, and there's still some unknowns around the structure of reporting and network contracting relationships. But even so, um, here we took a, a middle range in that 8 to 12 percent and looked at 10 percent um, of the estimated range of program costs, and uh, that looks like it's about 300 million. So currently, the ACA does not specify how the BHP administration is to be funded, and statutory language defining the permissible use of BHP funds raises questions regarding whether they may be used for administrative purposes. So if administration cannot be funded by the excess premium subsidies, administrative costs would need to be covered by other sources, such as state general fund or some other mechanism. So that's those two and that, uh, that uh, purple box at the top. Another area of clarification includes whether the federal reimbursement includes 95 or 100 percent of the copayment subsidy, a topic about which the ACA is a little bit ambiguous. The difference here um, between those two is about 61 million, a large number standing on its own, but relatively small fraction of the BHP program expenses. And the final uncertainty, uh, financial uncertainty we highlighted um, is the potential gap between federal payments and state level expenditures. This could, as we mentioned also, this could be due to the fact that individuals who roll, enroll and remain in the BHP could end the year with income that makes them ineligible for a BHP and instead eligible for Medicaid or the exchange. It's not yet known how the federal government would manage this discrepancy, but in the event that the state um, could be made at risk for this amount, um, estimates from uh, the Institute for Health Policy Solutions place this figure between 100 and $550 million. So these bottom two lines here, the risk in either of those uh, categories um, conceivably could be planned for and built into um, uh, program revenue as they are um, part of program expenses. And as such, these expenses are not likely to cause significant risk to the state fund, but they could cause some year-to-year -year, uh, program budgetary risk. So I'm just going to spend a, a minute walking through that bottom line on that last slide, that 100 to $550 million. So the difference between the federal uh, payment and the, the state uh, BHP costs. So the federal payment is based on annual income for the final calculation of how much an individual made at the end of the year. So if an individual's annual income either increases or decreases out of the BHP range, the federal BHP pay payment could be less than initially expected. But the BHP um, program eligibility is determined by projected annual income based upon earnings at a point in time. And as people switch jobs, they shift percent time, they work overtime, or they make changes to their work circumstance, the end salary is likely to differ from the projection um, at a moment in time. And as these life changes occur, and they do occur with great frequency, 
people may choose health insurance options that are most advantageous to them. So if individuals can roll in the BHP when their income falls into the BHP range, as they can under medical, Medi-Cal or healthy families, they may be similarly unlikely to disenroll when their income rises again, especially given the cost sharing differential between the potential BHP benefit design and the cost sharing likely on the exchange. So the difference between these, these two methodologies of calculating BHP costs could imply that the state could receive a federal BHP payment that is significantly lower than the state's BHP liabilities. The estimate for this difference by, um, is the 100 to 550 million that was articulated on the previous slide. So we can't talk, talk about just costs without spending a moment on savings as well. Um, so states that cover an expansion population, as Jerry um, uh, alluded to, under Medicaid with state-only funds could benefit from establishing a BHP under, whose, um, under which those populations would newly qualify for federal funding. So for California, the greatest potential here is to capture federal tax credit funding to cover uh, recent immigrants, those um, with immigrant status for less than five years, who are ineligible for the federal Medicaid match due to the waiting period. So the sum for this is estimated to be about $225 million. And again, there's a great deal of uncertainty related to that. There's likely many of you here in the audience um, who could quickly come up with a more refined estimate based on projected individuals in this coverage category at that time and more precise estimates of per person costs. This number is not intended to provide a definitive savings potential, but more realistically, a directional figure to offer some scale to the savings that's, that's uh, on the table here. Um, and this savings also assumes that state-funded Medicaid coverage for this population would remain intact. So uh, moving on to the next goal, the, to ensure that there is an adequate safety net for those who may need it. A frequent argument in our uh, interviews related to the BHP was that it could, uh, the BHP could help to preserve the safety net. As we dug deeper into the issue, we determined, as many of you know, that um, uh, many ways uh, parts of the safety net could benefit from a BHP, and we also heard articulated in many ways that there's no monolithic idea of the safety net. The mix of providers that comprise the safety net differs a great deal by region, by whether it's in an urban or rural setting, and by the unique provider dynamics of any particular place and the unique patient mix. And we'll walk through some of these differences. Um, the policy goal um, is, is to ensure that there's a safety net for those who may need it. And for the purposes of our conversation today, we're defining the safety net as providers who serve those who are covered by Medi-Cal or who are underinsured or uninsured. And examples include federally qualified health centers or FQHCs and community clinics, public hospitals, private providers that serve Medi-Cal and uninsured patients. And uh, feedback we gathered through interviews either expressed hope for the ways that the BHP could strengthen the safety net or concern for the ways that a BHP could challenge it, but all held, uh, held the belief in the importance of a strong safety net. So like the theme that's starting to emerge throughout our other findings that we're presenting, there's no single way that a, C a BHP could impact uh, this, uh, providers as well. Indeed, providers who serve a blend of public and commercial consumers could face uncertain changes in revenue due to a BHP and the net outcome for them would vary by uh, across providers. So there are some ways that a BHP could encourage stability. Broader insurance participation could lead to less uncompensated care, and BHP payments could be higher than Medicaid payments, and that would be a decision at the pro a program decision at the state level. And yet in other ways, the BHP could challenge provider stability. Increased demand for services among newly covered populations could, str uh, could strain provider capacity, and some individuals could migrate from commercial to BHP coverage, um, resulting in lower payment rates to those providers. So these contrasting perspectives could be played out differently, not just by category of provider, but by each individual provider, depending on their own unique patient mix. And uh, before we move on from the, this topic, um, a quick note about the prospective payment system, or PPS. PPS requires that the state pay to FQHCs payment on a per visit basis that is equal to 100% of the cost of providing care. The ACA is silent on PPS as it relates to the BHP and SB 703 does not currently include PPS payment rates for the BHP. It's difficult to assess how PPS rates uh, to the FQHCs could change under different scenarios of the BHP 
Due to ambiguity in the ACA and new guidance from HHS related to QHP uh, contracting with S FQHCs. That is a lot of letters. <laughs> That's a lot of alphabet soup. Okay. <laughs> and I think everyone followed, so. Um, uh, moving on to the next goal, continuity of coverage, hopefully with some simpler, simpler language here. The next policy goal is related to the continuity of coverage and care. This goal is to minimize disruption of coverage um, and care delivery as individuals' financial status changes. So uh, under this policy goal, there's no way to say it more simply um, than that we are inserting another source of coverage into the mix. Uh, in a program that may be able to uh, offer coverage for a lot of people, but which would require significant coordination among Medi-Cal, the BHP, and the exchange to ensure continuity of coverage and care. And despite the best, best intentions, this coordination is difficult. It will require the cooperation of a broad set of institutions, each with its own set of incentives and priorities. And even with every effort to mitigate, there are still four programs here instead of three. And uh, looking at uh, the next uh, policy goal, impact to the exchange. One of the most uh, prominent, prominent policy goals explored in other studies of the BHP includes how the BHP could impact the exchange. And the most often explored dynamics, aspects of this dynamic are how the BHP could impact both volume and risk mix. Um, so the BHP could impact volume, um, the volume on the exchange um, through several mechanisms. Operating costs could be distributed across a smaller membership, potentially reduce negotiating power for prices, quality uh, standards, and innovation that comes from that reduced uh, number of members. And some carriers may be less willing to invest in exchange readiness if there's a smaller pool of consumers. The often, um, in addition, um, there is also controversy on how the BHP population could impact the risk mix on the exchange. And again, there were two perspectives here um, that arose quite strongly in our interviews. Some assert that removing the BHP population from the exchange could lower risk on the exchange, assuming that the BHP population is sicker due to lower income. And others um, uh, felt that, reducing, um, that removing the BHP population from the exchange could raise the risk on the exchange, assuming that the BHP population is younger and healthier and needing less care than those, the rest of those on the exchange. And as indicated by the UCL research, UCLA research, the risk for the BHP population is quite similar to the risk of the rest of those on the exchange. Um, but still, risk could be impacted by other purchasing dynamics um, that we discussed earlier. So often the discussion of the BHP, of how the BHP could impact the exchange, focuses on volume and risk mix because these are critical and the most immediately quantifiable impacts that a BHP could have on the exchange. However, altering the landscape in a, for a large group of Californians will also have broader implications for the health marketplace as a whole and for the marketplace on the exchange. Um, we we uh, saw these as sort of a rippling effect and I've articulated a few of them here. So initially, planned participation um, uh, some, especially the managed Medicaid plans, could decide to forego participating in the exchange if they see significant opportunity for immediate market expansion through the BHP. So the action of these carriers and other changes in planned participation could have lip rippling effects. So for instance, that could result in uh, raising the price of the lowest priced uh, qualified health plan on the exchange. It could raise the price of the benchmark qualified health plan, which is the second lowest silver plan option, uh, which impacts the subsidy level. And it could also reduce the number of QHPs on the exchange, which could potentially impact competitive pricing. And as those uh, two effects um, combine together, it could also impact the momentum for the exchange overall. Um, so there are varying estimates here, but if the BHP changed the enrollment in the exchange from relatively 2 million to 1 million, 1 million is still a figure for a viable exchange nationally. As we all know, there are many states who would welcome an exchange with a million people in it. However, the smaller number represents a significantly smaller share of the California marketplace itself, and that could influence some carriers to invest where there are more consumers. And further, these one million um, people are not evenly distributed or all concentrated in one region. So reducing the membership opportunity by about half could impact the desirability of the exchange for some pairs, especially when they are considering the volume available um, in a particular subset of California, a particular region or area. 
And if any prominent uh, carriers in the state would choose to forgo participation for that reason, it could take some of the momentum away from the exchange as a visible and viable marketplace as a whole. So we shared a lot of information um, already here, and we've got just some final closing thoughts, and then we'll open it up for conversation. It's important to, um, to, to ground back into um, some of the uncertainties that we're, that we're all still looking at here. Many of these sources of uncertainty limit the, the analysis that we can do, and some variables will be defined and others will emerge from complex market and individual dynamics over time. So some of these unknowns will become known. So there's some near-term expected clarifications, like the federal uh, policy decisions that I articulated earlier. And there are some state-level decisions, where the BHP could be housed, or um, definitions of premium, cost-sharing, benefit design, and such. But then others will not be known um, until they emerge over time, such as how many consumers actually enroll and which types of coverage, health status and other characteristics of those who do enroll, and the actual price for the second lowest silver plan, which will determine the federal BHP payment level. So um, our analysis did not allow us to clear the path or raise the flag directionally for any of these major policy goals we addressed. Instead, it served to complicate the picture of how a BHP could impact California. And this diversity was reflected in the viewpoints of our interviewees. Few were unilaterally for or against the BHP, although there were some. But rather, conversations with experts tended to have an exploratory tone, noting that the impact could be complex and differ by stakeholder or constituent. In this murky landscape, we attempted to offer a rating for how the BHP could impact California under its best and worst case scenarios. To be sure, the outcome would not land squarely in either of these, and even for a distinct constituent group. And there's no just as there's no uniform view of who those are who are income eligible for the BHP, our findings suggest that there's no uniform view of how the BHP could impact California consumers and stakeholders. So for a few closing thoughts, um, beyond the financial threshold questions addressed, there are significant ways, I think we all could see, that a BHP could impact California policies goal, policy goals and there's no definitive answer of how they could play out. But we, I think we all recognize that any significant change in the insurance coverage for a large block of California's population would affect not just that group in isolation, but also other consumers and stakeholders in the market. A lot of information and a lot of opportunity for further thought and discussion, I hope. Um, we uh, struggle a little bit to find the right reactor or reactors to this topic because there are so many uh, diverse considerations and perspectives, and we uh, could not think of um, anyone who could better reflect a diversity of viewpoints um, than Lucian Wilson, who is so attuned to so many different um, issues in this state. Um, so because time didn't allow us to uh, have in a different person all the different perspectives, um, we took one who we thought could be um, balanced in his assessment. And so Lucian, thank you. And please share some initial thoughts, and then we'll have questions from you all. So I think uh, I just now know that I have multiple personalities. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Marion, uh, and thank you, uh, CHCF, for putting this on. And really, uh, thank you so much, Nancy and, uh, and Jerry, for, for what you did here. I, when I first started thinking about the BHP, I thought of it as really pretty uh, clear choice. And I, I saw really only two sides to the issue. I now see about 10 or 12 or 13. So uh, uh, the two sides I saw originally is, OK, yes, we could get the uh, premiums down and the cost sharing down. And the, and the way we would do that is we would reduce payments to providers so we had fewer providers participating. So uh, you know that was, a, that was a hell of a trade off, as far as I could see, and, and, a, and a difficult one. Uh, so I, I wanted to kind of uh, share some of the thoughts that I had af after reading this. And uh, uh, Marion, give me a signal if I start running out of time. Uh, the, the, the first was uh, really uh, with ITUP, our goal is uh, cover all the uninsured. And so uh, anything that increases coverage of the uninsured 
uh, such as lower premiums, it looks awfully attractive. Uh, giving further thought to that, uh, uh, you know, there really are a lot of other issues on which people buy coverage. And if you think about it, you think of Medicare program where people have to pay a bit, you know, that's about 96% participation. Uh, Medicaid uh, uh, nationally uh, and in California has estimated to be around 60% participation. So there is some, some sense that particular programs have uh, some, uh, some issues associated with them in the, in the public's, public's mind. And, and clearly uh, paying by itself is not, uh, is not the complete and utter end all of the decision. Uh, if you look at uh, Jerry's uh, studies uh, through the, uh, you know, he's basically saying with employer coverage, you get about an 85% uh, take up rate. I think uh, we'd be all pleased if we could see an 85% take up rate uh, in, uh, in the exchange as well as in Medicaid. And so I think that it's really, as you both have said, a, a mix of factors that, uh, that induce people to enroll and it's not just cost. The second thing uh, is, from my perspective, the strong exchange is vital. It's vital not only because it's a transformational event, I think, for the individual and small employer market, but it also has, I think, important political uh, functions as well in terms of showing exactly what the Affordable Care Act and what the ex exchange can do. So I think weakening the exchange and splitting it up, in, up into two, two pools has, has, some, has some real negatives associated with it. Uh, I've felt from the start uh, that BHP was attractive because it offers a, a place for the safety net to really begin to organize and coordinate and, and deliver. And I think that is a really important function of, of, of the exchange. And I think one of the things that, I mean, of the basic health plan, I think one of the things you look at when you see uh, the data we just saw is that, uh, you know, a third of the people who are using the safety net, a third of the people are using private providers, and a third of them have no usual source of care. Uh, so I'm not sure how this uh, ends up cutting. Um, in my conversations with people uh, about this over the, over the last nine months or so, uh, I've found that uh, we've kind of resorted to what I would describe as kind of polarized uh, uh, caricatures and kind of unspoken assumptions here. Uh, the, the first is that the basic health plan basically equals Medi-Cal. Uh, and the second is that the exchange is going to uh, purchase the most expensive fee-for-service plans with the highest uh, co-pays and deductibles possible. So it's, you know, it's either going to be Medi-Cal or going to be completely unaffordable through the exchange. And I, I don't think that's uh, true on, I, on either regard. I do think the, the midpoint, if you look at it, is Healthy Families, which really was pretty popular with both uh, public and private uh, uh, providers and so forth. So uh, the other thing I think we should acknowledge is there's really been a convergence. So Medi-Cal is a range of managed care plans, uh, mostly eight, almost all HMOs. Healthy Families is uh, range of plans. Uh, private insurance is a range of plans. Most most Californians are in HMO, so it, there there are some there are some ways in which there is uh, more convergence than, than we should acknowledge. So then I come down to, well, is this really about market shares? Is this really you know a safety net ha feels it has a better market share in a BHP than it does elsewhere? I, and I'm I'm just saying. Given the overall fears that I have about weakening the exchange, why shouldn't the exchange just be the people who administer the BHP and be the folks who contract with BHP plans as part of the full menu of options that would be available? And people can choose exactly what they want. Uh, I think finally, uh, Jerry and I have ha had this discussion before, and there was one piece of information I just want to be clear about. When we talk about the legal permanent residence, uh, Medi-Cal pays for uh, full scope services. The federal government pays for 
the uh, emergency Medi-Cal component. Uh, so the, the savings we get are the difference between the emergency, emergency and, the, and the full scope. But I don't think that's the extent of the savings. I think there are really quite a lot of uh, other components of state and county spending that re reach this population between 133 and 200, and we shouldn't forget that. And for many of those programs and the providers associated with them, uh, the BHP looks to them to be an easier transition. And I think that was the, the point that Stan Dorn made in his. Uh, so I think those are, the, those are the key takeaways I had. I'd like to uh, close with one final thing, which is just please, everybody, let's keep it simple. Well. There you have it, your marching orders. Um, and all of us who have any, uh, uh, are paying any attention to the implementation know that that is a pretty tall job. Um, thank you, Lucian, lots of good thoughts there. So um, let me say again, don't sneak out the door without filling out an evaluation form, please. And um, if you have a question, uh, my colleague Danny has a microphone, so he'll be moving around. I'm gonna start with a question of my own, though, so move toward him or, or raise your hand if you want him. So, so I wanted to start um, actually with stepping back a little bit. Um, so we have focused today on the basic health program option because of course it is a very specific provision outlined in the Affordable Care Act and it is a decision uh, that California will make one way or another, should, should we or shouldn't we. But the policy goals that Nancy articulated, getting people into coverage, worrying about affordability, continuity, a viable provider network, those are all concerns that could be advanced by any number of means and approaches. And I would like to invite you each to sort of step back from the yes or no, what would the BHP mean question, to the what else or what in addition or what within the BHP should be done to advance those goals. So maybe I'll start with you, Lucian, and then we'll go around. Yeah, I ended up thinking, having uh, looked at this, that the BHP idea is is a, is a right one, but I'm I'm not sure that I want to divorce it from the exchange. I want to keep it within the exchange, uh, and I want to uh, give give a choice of plans within the exchange, so that the person who wants a BHP plan buys a BHP plan. The person who wants a non-BHP plan buys the non-BHP plan. And I recognize that that is not exactly what the federal government had in mind, but that's what I have in mind. So as, um, as somebody who's been involved for about four years now in evaluating efforts in the state to strengthen the safety net under the health care coverage initiative uh, demonstration project and now with the uh, uh, LIP program, low income health program, uh, program. Uh, we've been at UCLA looking at what counties are doing to strengthen their safety nets. And so um, because we're so involved in evaluating and, and talking with counties about uh, their efforts to strengthen the safety net, my initial reaction to the BHP option uh, when ACA was first enacted was that, well, here's a golden opportunity for California. To, we've been investing at the county level and strengthening safety net programs for uh, several years now. And with the LIP, we've got this transition to ACA. When, when CI, HCCI started in 2007, it wasn't clear that there was a roadmap or there, there was light at the end of the tunnel. When that evaluation started, we thought the best we could do is strengthen the county safety net, and that might be our best option for expanding coverage in the foreseeable future. Three years later, we had ACA, and now there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, counties have uh, more of an incentive to strengthen their safety net to begin that transition. And my initial reaction was, why waste this investment in strengthening county safety net programs if we don't try to pursue uh, the basic health plan option? I, I think that the, the option that I've, I'm most comfortable with at this point is having counties that have made significant progress in the last five years in, in strengthening the safety net to participate in the exchange either as uh, uh, providers and actually compete for patients or to be able to contract with the providers, with the insurance companies that are going to participate in the exchange and particularly are gonna serve lower income, the lower income patients or, or I should say Californians within the exchange population. And, and let me just add, I don't think it's been explicitly um, stated, stated here, but in addition to that question of the volume of, of 
the lowest income people who would otherwise be in the exchange. Those are, of course, the people that bring with them the largest subsidies or, or that were, are uh, – uh, to whom the largest subsidies are available. So, uh, you know, those of us who have thought about what attracts and keeps people sticking with coverage, um, that, that subsidy share is something that certainly came up in the interviews Nancy had and that I think is on the minds of many people concerned about the viability of the exchange. So as if you take away that core, the people who remain are less highly subsidized and may be a little more uh, susceptible to uh, coming in only when they really need coverage through the exchange. So just a little bit of clarification and sorry to interrupt interrupt the flow not at all that's an important point that rose quite a bit um and in, in response to your question marianne i was uh, also thinking about uh, lucian's perspective there because this notion of the bhp being administered through the exchange came up quite a bit um throughout our interviews and so um and it's an appealing option i think because th those um most people that we spoke to had an investment in the successful exchange and were also trying to have lower <laughs> um uh, cost sharing for um, individuals in this income bracket. And so that seemed like an appealing middle ground. So you can maybe leverage some of the exchange administration or joint contracting ability, uh, spread costs and risk over a broader set of people. So there was this appealing notion around that. But then at the same time, there was just like everything, some complicating factors t to that because there may be some less overlap in the contracts between the BHP population and the other contracts on the exchange. So how much that, um, that joint contracting capability um, is there um, was up for question. Um, and then some of the other um, factors sort of like that, uh, you know, joint leverage for quality or some of the other ways that um, there were goals for the exchange to help uh, impact the marketplace as a whole could be conceivably done whether the BHP is with the exchange or not through collaboration or, or um, other mechanisms. So, and then there, the the um, the question came up quite a bit: Is that really a realistic task for the exchange to take on with these big deadlines looming? And of course, that's not something that um, I could begin to speak to. But it was a question that was a rate that did come up um, as both an appealing option and again where there may be some challenges for how that you know the, the idea then the execution of it would maybe a little more complex. Audience question time. Almost all the problems that we have, whether they are affordability, access, continuity of coverage, consistency of quality, enrollment in public programs, are made worse by the fact that we have this ridiculously Byzantine complex system that is creating headaches for providers. It's creating headaches for people who would enroll in these programs. They are not able to enroll in these programs. It's creating a terrifically difficult task for everybody who wants to do consumer assistance and having another public program will uh, make this will dig this hole deeper and so could you put a little bit finer point on some of the things that you heard in that particular regard around uh, that issue this issue that you're raising came up quite a bit um, in the interviews especially those with providers and with uh, representatives of the consumer groups or consumer advocates so um, initially, we expected a lot of the consumer advocates to be um, strongly in favor of a BHP because of the cost sharing uh, benefit. But um, these issues around um, continuity uh, across programs um, and raising complexity um, for different consumer groups was a huge concern. Um, and one that uh, complicated their perspective on the BHP made it hard for people to, um, for some of the interviewees to say what this would mean for their own groups other than a lot of education in our own, you know, using um, our, our own uh, methods of outreach. Um, and at the same time, um, that issue uh, arose um, with some of the providers in medical groups, um, and they gave examples of some of the current transitions. So especially, you know, some of the provider groups, maybe some of the integrated delivery systems that have, um, uh, accept coverage from multiple sources. So they're trying to retain that same individual, whether or not they're being covered through Medicaid, employer-sponsored coverage, or what else, that um, even if they keep that same person through various coverages, um, that there are files lost, um, medical history lost, the di different uh, payment history loss components that make it hard for them to provide that continuity of care. So there was um, uh, concern um, around that and how it would sort of play out logistically despite everyone's best intentions, I would say. Does that answer your question? Yeah. The analysis of how the potential for the uh, these plans could impact counties, I think, is very critical to this discussion, 
because the counties have played a very important part in this. The networks that we're talking about are basically networks that have been developed within individual counties, particularly with the health, uh, with the low-income health plan. And I can tell you that our providers are, are getting very, very concerned about potential for reduction in, in provider payment through, this, uh, through a basic health plan. I think that's just a terrific example of every every locale, every um, every safety net uh, is a little different um, depending on the part of the state you're in and presumably the part of the country. Did you did you want to react or add to that? I mean, it was mostly a comment, but yeah. I, I think it's well taken. And no, I agree. Uh, so my only reaction is that I, I agree with you completely, and I think that one way of strengthening participation of, of the safety net within the exchange is just to have a stronger, or one way to do it or accomplish that is to have stronger enforcement or requirements for contracting with safety net providers and allowing the state to use a safety net definition that is broad enough to capture what's actually going on within each of the counties uh, to, and not to limit it to a narrow definition that, you know, a public hospital only. And I think that kind of contracting language is exactly what took place or I should say review of safety net capability and capacity is exactly what took place when counties had initially to participate in the health care coverage initiative and then under LIP. Uh, and if those are inadequate or insufficient in any way, those could be strengthened. But I think counties had to meet a pretty high standard to participate in the programs uh, and requiring health plans in the exchange to contract with those networks I think is one way of accomplishing uh, expanded access. Good morning. I'm Sarah Nichols uh, from SEIU California. And um, thank you for your presentation. I didn't hear any mention of or new estimates on the take up rate that um, folks would might have for the basic health plan versus the um, exchange subsidies. And it seems to us that that's a crucial number to get clarity on in order to know instead of just speculate about what the effect would be on the exchange. Well, you're correct um, in observing that we did not present any estimates of the take-up rate. Uh, in, uh, in terms of our CalSIM model, uh, we have not done that estimate. Uh, I think we've, we've identified that uh, there isn't a good literature right now uh, or evidence base for determining what the take-up would be in the basic health plan. Um, and as a result, we haven't modeled it. Now, obviously, there's a lot of interest in this, and it's something that we can work on. But it doesn't, our existing model doesn't really predict very well what, what, what will happen in that world. Um, for, in separate analyses that we've presented to the Exchange Board last month, we did show that um, there, it, within the currently within the current exchange eligible population, that take up is higher among lower income individuals, and that's largely because of the higher subsidies that are available. So what we see in that 139 to 400 percent eligible population is higher take up at the lower income range or that B, B, HP um, um, eligible population. But what it would be under BHP requires a set of assumptions about out-of-pocket spending that we haven't modeled yet. And it could involve a set of assumptions about all the things we've been talking about today around the that are extremely difficult, I think, to get our arms around, given that we don't know exactly what the offerings in the exchange will be. We don't know exactly what the payment rates or the participation in BHP uh, plans would be. So I appreciate the desire, and I think we all are looking for some concrete numbers to hang our hats on. But I, um, but CHCF has not been prepared uh, to invest sig significantly in those kinds of models because we do feel, as Jerry indicates, the state of the art kind of would require that they be pretty speculative, and you know. It may well be worth a continued conversation if this is something that a broad set of audiences would benefit from. But I think there are some inherent limitations in going too far down that path. 
I wish you would invest that <laughs> in that. I actually don't think there's any way in which uh, any any single thing that could shed more light on um, the the policy decision that has to be made here than that number. Well, Sarah, I I, I looked at this uh, not as extensively as anybody else has, but uh, over the last couple of days, and you know, there's a fairly linear progression. Uh, that uh, lower price equals better participation, assuming there are no other variables. And there are other variables, and I saw nothing uh, in that review which would allow you to make any really strong uh, case for exactly what the impact of those variables are, other than it's very clear that they're there and that they do have a big, in they do have a big influence. So uh, I'm. Marion, uh, you know, if you can get hold of that, great. But. I, I really appreciate the comment, and I understand, again, where it's coming from and that there would be value to doing that. So we will consider it, and, uh, you know, others either here now or um, offline. If you want to add your thoughts about uh, the pros and cons of that approach, I'm open to hearing them. But I did want to ask you, though, for people who are trying to get on general assistance and they have health and they get health care through the county, has there been a survey about how well that county, the general assistance programs and the county programs are ready to set people up to be part of this, part of this benefit exchange? I, I, I think that uh, at least a portion of the population that you're describing is eligible for um, the LIP program. And I, I don't recall, I, I think, I'm not sure if my colleagues from UCLA are in the audience and can remind me what the eligibility is here in Sacramento. I think it's, you know, LIP allows uh, enrollment of uninsured adults up to 200% of poverty, but not every county's uh, expanded their program that large. And off the top of my head, my recollection is that Sacramento is one of the counties that doesn't go up to 200%. But regardless, um, the counties are enrolling uninsured adults today in in this LIP program, there are over 350,000 Californians right now who have health insurance through LIP that would not have it otherwise. Um, they don't qualify for, for Medi-Cal. <clears throat> and um, the counties are planning and working to transition LIP eligible uh, Californians today into the exchange or into Medi-Cal in 2014. And that's I mean, that is what counties are working uh, intensively to do under this program. That's the bridge or the transition to health care reform. And just to add uh, two other things, uh, the waiver says that uh, the people who are in the LIPS are supposed to be auto-enrolled uh, into coverage. I, how that's going to happen is anybody's guess. But the other, the other piece of it is most of the folks, most of those 300,000, are in the under 133 percent of FPL, so they're mostly going to be going into into Medicaid, Medi-Cal. One important issue I wanted to raise is where kids fit into this picture. Um, sure, it's a great point to call out, and this uh, topic did come up through the course of our interviews, and it's also um, explored quite a bit in other, many of the other state studies related to a BHP. Um, because there is evidence that um, uh, ch when children or parents are covered with the same, uh, have the same coverage, they're more likely to, to seek care. So this question came up, and in many states, there's a just assumption in their analyses that the BHP is um, administered by the same uh, entity that administers Medicaid um, for that continuity reason, or largely because of that for um, but for a number of continuity reasons, but, but that being among them. Um, and it also... Um, was arose in some of the conversations um, through the interviews, there were those who were quite interested in where the BHP would be housed in California with the exchange or with Mr. Mib or with Medicaid and sort of exploring some of the dynamics related to that. So when we, when we looked at um, sort of where to focus this research, you know, there's those core financial issues that everybody needs to know. But in addition, there are these other ways that a BHP could impact the state or different stakeholders in the state positively and negatively, and um, sort of the goal of this was to highlight some of those issues, and that was one of the ones that came up through the conversation there. What are some of these other dimensions as well? 
And and I'll just add it mostly an acknowledgement, which is that you know there there are these issues. That sometimes this is articulated as where is the program administered, who administers it. But of course, really the issues are who are the plans with whom these different programs are contracting, who are the pri providers in turn with whom those plans are contracting. Is there continuity and smoothness across those different? Uh, programmatic funding sources that can serve families and people well. And I, I think that is, of course, the underlying motivating goal that is on the minds of people at the exchange, that is on the minds of people at public programs, that is on the minds of advocates who care about consumers. But, um, but you know, as that little sandwich uh, chart demonstrates, easier said than done sometimes, given the realities of the way that programs are run. So we are approaching the end of our time. Um, a great set of questions and comments, a great set of um, speakers and presentations. I want to thank them all very much. Um, we will have material available on our website. Comments after the fact are always welcome. This is a topic that we know um, elicits a lot of interest, and we appreciate your being with us, and we appreciate your um, thoughtful comments now or down the road. So thank you very much.